I haven't seen this many Jews for this long in shul since Yom Kippur. <laughs> so like Ali said, I'm going to talk about uh, abuse and I'm going to talk about addiction. But before I do, because right away when I say either of those words, a great number of people in any audience say, oh, this is interesting, let's hear about those people. And we're not talking about those people. We're talking about all of us, we're talking about every human being, we're talking about the human condition. And you don't need to sympathize with people who are victims, people who are addicts. You need to empathize, you need to find it in yourself. So, since I'm a rabbi, predictably, I'll tell you some Bible stories. It happens to be by divine providence that yesterday in Shul, we just read the first Parsha, the first Torah reading of the yearly Torah cycle. We started again with Bereshis, and we read about Adam and Eve and the sin of the tree of knowledge. Sin of the tree of knowledge affected all of us, it affected the human psyche, it affected human nature for all time. But what was that sin? What was that experience? What was human consciousness like before and how was it forever afterward? You see, before the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve were innocent. They were like babies. And then they ate from that tree of knowledge and they gained understanding. What kind of understanding? What is it like a fruit that you eat and suddenly you can win a trivial pursuit? You become like a walking Wikipedia? What does it mean they gain knowledge? So look at the story. The first thing that happened after they gained knowledge. What did they do? What was the first thing they did after they gained knowledge? Huh? They covered themselves. And God found them wearing their new fig leaf wardrobe. And he asked Adam, what's up with this? What's up with these clothes? Clothing was a new thing. It had just been invented that moment. God asked him, what is it? What are you doing? What's with the, with the new outfit? Adam said, Eve saw it in a catalog. She thought it would look cute on us. <laughs> no, Adam said, I didn't want to be naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? Now you have to understand, Adam wasn't a fool. If you would have asked him before the tree of knowledge, are you naked? He would say, yeah, I'm naked. And so? It's like when we were kids and we used to try to harass somebody. We would say, hey, your epidermis is showing. The epidermis mean, means your skin, so it was a, a tedrea cup, right? The Rebbe once said that before the tree of knowledge, a person would be no more embarrassed of his reproductive organs than he is of the arm on which he lays tefillin. It's just a body part that I used to do a mitzvah, the first mitzvah, right? What's Shameful about it. So he knew he was naked. It didn't mean anything. It didn't have any deeper significance than that. It was just a fact. Naked. Then he ate from that tree of knowledge. And what was the knowledge that he gained? Self-knowledge. But I don't mean self-knowledge like insight. I mean self-knowledge in the sense of crippling self-awareness. I mean self-consciousness that prevents us from living in the moment and keeps drawing us back into our own heads. I'm talking about terminal uniqueness, lonely in a crowded room, always wanting to be a part of and instead feeling apart from. Those are the symptoms of the tree of knowledge, self-consciousness. 
And we've been battling that devil since day one. I had a teacher in yeshiva who told us that Chassidim used to tell a story that the angel of death, the Malach HaMovis, complained to God that his name is bad for business because the word death tends to scare people. But his job is to make people make stupid choices that will ruin their lives. How do you get a guy to even listen to your suggestions when you have death in your name? So God says, okay, no problem. You get a DBA, you know, doing business as, and you call yourself Sutton. He says, what does it mean? He says, well, adversary. Okay, nice Hebrew name. Tries it out, he comes back, he says, God, it's still not working. I'm trying to convince people to make stupid life-ruining decisions. And they say, what's your name? I say, Sutton. They say, what does it mean? I say, adversary. Whose adversary? Well, yours. Well, excuse me, I don't want to take advice from you. God says, okay, you got a point. Call yourself Yetzirah. The evil inclination. He tries it out. He comes back. He says, God, I'm showing my cards. It's got evil in the name. God says, okay, you got a point. I got a name for you. It's, it's much more innocuous. It's almost cute. The Chassidim came up with it. It's called Nefesh Abamis, animal soul. It's almost like warm and fuzzy. Go try that one. So the angel of death slash adversary slash evil inclination goes and he tries out the name animal soul. And he comes back and says, God... It almost works, but just, be just before I'm about to close the deal, the guy says, who am I taking life advice from again? And I say, animal soul. And they say, you know what? I really don't want to base decisions on advice from an animal. You know, I'm going to call some friends. And then it you know, blows the deal. So uh, God says, okay, you're right. I didn't want it to come to this. But I've got no choice. I mean, you've got to be able to do your job. You've got to be able to get in there and mess people's lives up and have them actually listen to you. i got a name for you. And in fact, this is a perfect name for what you do because if you do business under this name, not only will people listen to you, but they will always be convinced that you have their best interests at heart. And in fact, even when people they love tell them differently, they will not listen to them, they will listen to you. And the angel of death slash adversary slash evil inclination slash animal soul says, God lay it on me, what's this new name? And God says, call yourself Yesh, self, conscious existence. And that's what he did. And since that time, as Chassidim related, the angel of death slash adversary slash animal soul slash evil inclination has been doing business under the name of Yesh as the self, as ego, or as we say, ego is E-G-O, edging God out. And he's had such success, he was able to hire a different representative to mess with each and every one of us. What is the curse, what is the blight of humankind self-consciousness, self-awareness. Best definition of ego I ever heard, in English at least, was ego is the conscious sense of separation from. From what? From anything. Conscious, conscious sense of separation from you, from God, from life, from reality, ultimately from my own self. That self-consciousness, the Torah tells us right in the first Torah reading, is synonymous with sexual guilt and shame. It's one and the same. It is the archetype. When one is self-aware, it is because of an identity crisis based on an awareness, a hyper-awareness, an uncomfortable awareness. You know, the doctors say that if your body part is healthy, you're not aware of it. If you're aware of a body part, that means there's something wrong. Before the tree of knowledge, of self-knowledge, of self-consciousness, Adam and Eve were able to have shameless, by shameless I don't mean Wanton, but I mean shame free. I mean innocent and holy and pure intimacy. And ever since that time afterwards, 
They got a hang up and they bequeathed it to us and now everybody has that hang up and everybody's identity is so wrapped up. And let's, let's not mince words and let's not speak euphemistically and not, let's not dance around it. When they say teenagers, adolescents, are self-conscious, you know what that means? It means they're becoming sexually aware. They're one and the same concept. When you see a, an album of a wedding and you look at a group picture and the first picture you look at or you look for is you look for yourself. What are you looking for? Oh, do I look good? Look good to whom? For what? Why? For what purpose? This is the human condition. We've been cursed with this awareness, this pure and holy thing that makes us godlike, and we ruin it with self-consciousness or it was ruined for us with the injection of self-consciousness. That's not unique to survivors of child sexual abuse. That is universal to all of us. Now you compound that with an experience that brings added secrecy, shame, isolation, self-awareness, that drives me deeper into my head further away from reality, further away from the here and now. And what you've done is you've taken the human condition itself and exaggerated it. You know, like they say, the Jews are like everybody else, only more so. The trauma of child sexual abuse is humanity itself writ large. So what's the solution? What do we do for our self-consciousness? What do we do for the fact that, you know, does my hair look good? Does my... You can't function that way. You can't function when you're in your own head and thinking about you. And you're narrating your own experience to yourself instead of being in the moment. So what do you do? What do you do when you're hopelessly stuck in that cerebral mind game and you just want to be part of life like everybody else. So you find some numbing elixir that sort of loosens you up and lets you forget about self for a while. And any addict will tell you that the drug of choice isn't fun. They're not partying. Somebody who goes out and works nine to five so he can go to the pub and have a pint is not an alcoholic. Someone who gets up and has a pint so he can do his nine to five is an alcoholic. If it's fun, it's recreation, you're an amateur. But if this is how you function, then you're a professional. Somebody who cannot function, somebody who cannot be in a social situation, somebody who cannot be, in a, in, 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 be with other people, somebody who cannot uh, go to a business meeting, somebody who cannot be at a family function without some form of numbness. Why? Because without the numbness, there I am, cripplingly self-conscious, stuck in my own head with my own ego, brewing in that, that never-ending mind game. You know what the word for it is? It's not drugs, it's not alcohol, it's not gambling, it's not sex. They're all just stimuli. You know what the word for it is? Distraction. Just give me something to get my mind off me for a minute so I can function. We are all distracted. We're all distracted. We carry around these devices now. If we don't like the reality around us, if like we don't want to be in the here and now, if we find present company even a tad boring, we go right into our little world, right in here, right? And we self-stimulate. We have a very low threshold for any type of stimulus, stimulus we don't like. And we have very easy and quick access to self-stimulation that just puts us in that bubble and if you're doing it for fun, then grow up and grow out of it. But if you're doing it to function, if you cannot do things that normal people do, that normal grown-ups do, without that numbness, then we're talking about a deeper issue. But if that's the solution you found, you're not an idiot, you're not weak, It may 
makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Yesterday we read Breshis. And this Shabbos coming up, we're going to read Parshas Noyach. Who was Noyach? Noyach Ish Tzadik, a righteous man. He was a righteous man. He was a holy man. Torah attests to the fact. And when he got off the ark and he was the survivor that would rebuild the whole world, what's the first thing he did after he brought a sacrifice to God? What was the first thing he did? He planted a vineyard, he made wine, he got drunk. How is this the act of a tzaddik, of a holy man? You want to understand something? Noyach was not a frat boy. He wasn't partying. He wasn't like, woohoo, we survived the flood, let's print up t-shirts, have a kegger, let's celebrate. He was a spiritual giant and a spiritual genius. And with the information he had, hindsight is 2020. We know better. We read his story. We say, Noah, don't do it. But we look back, we have hindsight 2020 vision. But Noah, in his time, made the best decision he could. He looked and he saw. What was the curse of humanity? What ruined everything? Since the moment that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of self-consciousness. Ego. Self-awareness. So he got off the ark, he saw a brand new world, everything was cleansed, everything was new, sparkling, shining, renewed. He said, let's attack the problem. The problem is crippling, crippling self-consciousness. The antidote is self-obliteration. If the ego and awareness of it ruins everything, then the release from ego will fix everything. And he went out methodically with spiritual and holy intent, and he made that wine, and he got drunk. And how drunk? You know, in everything, every mitzvah, there's an amount. What amount? How much wine did Noah have to drink? Aravias. How much wine did he have to drink? You think he overdid it? He didn't overdo it. He drank the exact prescribed amount for doing what he was trying to do. What was he trying to do? Undo the effect of the sin of the tree of self-consciousness. So what was the first symptom? Adam and Eve were aware of their nakedness. They experienced sexual shame. So what level of drunkenness did Noah deliberately pursue? Not like a mild, comfortable buzz. No, no. He was going for the level called pass out naked in the family room, which he proceeded to do. His adult children came home. One of them did terrible things to him. There's two opinions. You can look it up in the Gemara in Sanhedrin. You could see. But it involved sexual abuse. Then there was a whole fallout from it. And all the division, the racial tension we have in the world till this day stems from that dysfunctional alcoholic family argument that happened that night. But Noah wasn't a fool. He identified the problem accurately. The problem that ruins everything is ego, is self-consciousness, self-awareness, being in your own head. He says, we got to get rid of that in order to live life. Obliterate the ego, obliterate self-consciousness. That's why if you ever talk to an addict, they use words like, I'm going to get wrecked, I'm going to get torn up, I'm going to get uh, trashed. And it, this is a good thing? Why do you want to get trashed? In fact, loved ones will say, Bubala, stop it, you're destroying yourself. Which is rather ironic because, yes, no kidding, I'm attempting now to destroy self. That's where I'm heading. I'm, I'm not trying to get comfortably buzzed. I'm not trying to have fun. I'm trying to blot out self-awareness so I can function like the way the rest of you do when you're sober.
Don't think that there's a person in this room or on this planet who can't relate to this firsthand. We all know what self-consciousness is, and we all know what it means to seek out distraction and self-stimulation in order to not feel what we would otherwise be feeling. There's just people who feel it more deeply and for whom the anti-ego uh, uh, medication is even more urgently required. The term that I came up with, Ellie mentioned God of our understanding. It's okay, you can, I can plug the book because I think I make about 80 cents per copy and they haven't paid me royalties for two years, so I really don't really gain anything from it. There was a term that I came up with. I thought it was clever. I don't know. I'll share it with you. But the term is a spiritual canary. What's a spiritual canary? Well, what's a canary? You're familiar, no doubt, with the idiom, the canary in the coal mine. That comes from a real thing. Um, back in the old days, when they open up a new area of a mine, it's, it was possible that it would release this poisonous gas, which is tasteless and invisible and odorless and the miners could die from it. So what they used to do, you know, you're aware of this, the miners used to go down into the coal mine with a canary. And the canary sings, tweet, 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 tweet. And then uh, one minute uh, the canary's singing kind of slower tempo and then the canary sort of takes uh, intermission. And then, oh look, the canary is taking a nap on the bottom of the cage. No, the canary's dead. Everybody clear out, okay. So is the canary a toxicologist? Why does he know it's poisonous before everybody else? Because the canary is just like everyone, only more so. Whatever's going to kill the miners kills the canary first. Ego, self-consciousness, self-awareness, uncomfortable in your own skin, that plagues every human being on the planet. There are some precious souls, we'll call them spiritual canaries, who feel that more acutely. Who feel the ego awareness. Who feel, to use a philosophical term, existential angst. What's existential angst? Existent hurts. How do you remedy that? Try to turn the whole family upside down, trying to make the spiritual canary comfortable. Bubbola, what's wrong? Should we fluff your pillow? Should we turn up the AC? Should we kick your sister out of the house? What do you need? What do you mean, what do I need? My problem isn't a specific my problem. My problem is existence is my problem. The fact that I am aware that I am a something, a yesh, separate from the oneness, from the all, is killing me. Now, they don't usually articulate it in such the theological terms. Usually they say, Mom, get the hell out of my room, but that's what they mean. So how does a person become a spiritual canary? I don't know. But what I can tell you, anecdotally, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, and I'm not here to quote statistics, and I'm not pretending to be able to share anything but my own experience, but the calls that I get from spiritual canaries, and, and while I'm sitting in this room and, and being moved by all the speakers tonight, and, and, and between the speakers, I'll take a glance at my phone and I'll, and I'll see the emails come. They don't stop coming in. Three in, three in the morning, they don't stop coming in. Five in the morning, I mean, I cannot get back to all of the people who are contacting me, and I don't think I'm the only guy in the world that people contact, okay? So whatever numbers you think there are, multiply it by a thousand, by a million. And the calls that I am able to take, and the stories that I am able to spend time hearing, I can tell you, again, I'm not gonna quote statistics, I don't have numbers, I don't care. But the spiritual canaries, those people who need constant, deep self-stimulation in order to numb their self-consciousness, the overwhelming majority, I would guess 90%, are survivors of child sexual abuse. 
and you want to define what is a spiritual canary, what, he, what, what a self-medicating person, someone who needs to be numb, it's not necessarily the druggie. It's not necessarily the person who, who, who lost his house gambling in Atlantic City. You know, uh, Ellie was telling me before we came over here that he, he was doing business, and I'll tell it very vaguely so no one should identify. He was doing business with somebody, a Jewish guy, and, and he knew this guy was a survivor of child sexual abuse. And he contacted him and says, come help us you know, support JCW. And the guy said, why should I support that cause? The victim should get over it. I got over it. And Ellie said, if you got over it, then how come I knew? You never told me. And the guy says, yeah, how did you know? And Ellie said, very simple. We were on a business trip together. We finished what we went there for. It was a good day. And I said, let's take a break. Let, 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 let's, let's go. Let's leave. And you said, no way, man. I work from the second I get up to the second that I drop. I don't stop. Okay. There's something in you that is so unsettled, so deep, that you can't even spend a minute doing nothing. We all know what that moment is like, you know, when you finally stop. And in fact, I, I, I shouldn't say we all know what that moment is like, because nowadays we don't, we don't, we don't. Because in the old days, we knew what the moment was like when you finally have to stop stimulating yourself. You have to lie down in bed, and, and you just have to face the thoughts in your head. Nowadays, we don't even do that, because if we don't want to face the thoughts in our head, we stay on the little piece of plastic until we literally pass out. We self-stimulate so that we should not, God forbid, be self-conscious for a moment until the second we pass out. And the phone drops from our hand. What I'm saying is that I don't want anyone to think that this is a cause. You're supporting a cause. This is not save the whales. Nobody needs your sympathy. Nobody needs your understanding. What I'm saying is this is all of our problems. This is the human condition. And that on some level, everybody knows what it's like to be uncomfortable in your own skin and have nowhere to run because wherever you go, there you are. And all of us know what it's like to try all types of distractions to try to get relief from that uncomfortable feeling and just finding that all those idols ultimately don't deliver what they promise. So I want to offer a solution before I wrap up because I think I spent a lot of time describing a problem. I was a teenager, and I was watching uh, Barbara Walters was interviewing Woody Allen. So when two Jews talk, inevitably, even if they try to avoid it, they end up talking about God. So this was back in the 80s, before everybody really knew what Woody Allen was up to. And she asked him, do you believe in God? And he thought good and long. And then he said, I believe in distraction. And the person I was watching it with said, Wow, do you see what an atheist Woody Allen is? He called God a distraction. And I said, You didn't see what I just saw. He called distraction God. We look for the distraction to do for us what ultimately only God can do. We want the distraction to give us peace, to make us feel okay for a moment. We want the distraction to let us be all right with ourselves. We want the distraction to just let us function like normal people do. 
And ultimately, the distraction does not allow that, does not facilitate that. Ultimately, the distraction gives us Noah's results. Degradation, pain, division, discord. But what we were looking for all along, it wasn't a foolish thing to look for. We did need relief from ego. We did need relief from self-consciousness. But it wasn't going to come from distraction. It was going to come from God. That's the difference between getting out of yourself and getting over yourself. Distraction is the attempt to get out of yourself, to stimulate yourself to a point where you're not you, and it doesn't work. What's getting over yourself? Getting over yourself, well, first of all, when we tell somebody, get over yourself, when do we say that, come on, get over yourself? It means don't take yourself so darn seriously. It means have a sense of humor, which is another way of saying embrace your humanity. And humanity, by the way, is a word that English got right. They got it from the Greek. It comes from the word humus, which means dirt. Adam is from Adama, an earthling. So if you're human, you're just dust, you're dirt. No offense. Just have a little humility. And when you embrace your humanity and you have a sense of humor to laugh at yourself and you have humility, that's getting over yourself. That's spirituality. Don't get out of yourself. Get over yourself. Literally rise above self. Self-transcendence. Rise above the ego. And what that means is lucid, sober thought without a trace of self-consciousness. In the here and now, totally aware of what's going on, with no need to numb myself, with no compulsion to distract myself. What is spirituality? Spirituality is right here. Spirituality is when my connection above allows me to function with you guys, to connect to other people, to connect to what's going on in the room around me, not to retreat into my own head, not to feel separate from you guys, not to feel different, but to feel connectedness, to feel oneness, to feel the real oneness. The Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echod, the oneness of it all that I'm just a part of, like you're a part of, that's getting over ourselves, that's spirituality. And uh, if you're a spiritual canary, for whatever reason, and you're on a quest for that oneness, share that gift. It's what we're all It's what we are all looking for. Okay, thank you. Good night.